Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is Episode 1, Barbarians. This show begins what will be a fascinating journey through the last 1500 years of Irish history, looking at some of the most interesting chapters in the island's past. While the coming episodes will chart everything from great battles to Viking raids, all the way through to rebellions, we will also stop in the houses, towns and villages to see what daily life was like for our distant and not so distant ancestors. This episode sets the scene by looking at what life was like around the year 500. This will take us deep into the day-to-day existence of our predecessors, tasting the food and even experiencing the horrors of a medieval dentist. Through the show, we will also see the arrival of Christianity to an Ireland that was a pagan outpost for centuries. So we begin with the title of today's show, Barbarians. For centuries, the people who inhabited Ireland were called barbarians by the powers of early medieval Europe. The Romans certainly thought this was the case. But what did they mean when they called people in Ireland barbarian? This was a phrase the Romans had picked up from the ancient Greeks, who used it as a catch-all phrase for people who lived in northern Europe, but who they had little comprehension of. Unable to understand the languages they spoke, the Greeks mimicked what they heard with the phrase bar 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 and hence the name Barbarian stuck. As we begin our journey back centuries, we will see though that life in Ireland was far more complex than the images this word often conjures up. But before we look at what these supposed barbarians got up to, we need to see what life was like in Ireland in the early Middle Ages. If we found ourselves in Ireland around the year 500, one of the most striking differences would no doubt have been the vast expanses of dense deciduous natural forests that ran for a mile after a mile over the landscape. Ireland today has very few trees in comparison, so the terrain would have been almost unimaginably different. While deforestation of the island was well underway, these dark, isolated, unrelenting forests would still have been very striking indeed. They would have made journeys difficult, lonely and more dangerous. In one way, this travel impediment made Ireland a much bigger place. Furthermore, rivers and mountains acted as frontiers, with crossing points being few and far between. That said, while rivers were a boundary, they could at the same time be a very important routeway because sailing was often far easier than walking through forests. Indeed, there were very few roads of any kind at least not what we would call roads anyway. There were tracks, some bulked up with planks of wood, but in the middle of winter, as you can imagine, these would have been, at best, mucky, damp and slippery, and maybe even missing in parts. These were not the busy routeways we associate with roads today. Instead, they would have been lonely, isolated places. Approaching fellow travellers would have to have been treated with equal fear and trepidation, As they neared, you would have had to be constantly sizing them up, trying to figure out whether they were friend or potential foe. Unsurprisingly, communication of all kinds in this world was at best sketchy. There were no mobile phones, emails or even posts, which makes it perplexing to think of how people arranged their lives. I guess they just had to accept the transience of human relationships, as communication over long distance was almost impossible. You just accepted that if you befriended a trader from far away, future contact was just unlikely. This certainly wasn't the world of long-distance relationships. If today's world is global, then Ireland in the 5th century was very much local. People knew a lot about their own kingdom, less about the province their kingdom was situated in, and for most people at least, virtually nothing about the world outside Ireland. However, while most knew very little about this outside world, it nevertheless had a very big impact on their lives, as we shall see next. Europe around the year 500 was changing and changing fast. For the previous thousand years, it had been dominated by the powerhouse that was the Roman Empire, but around 450 it had more or less collapsed in Western Europe. Nevertheless, When it had been at its height, Ireland had endured something of a fraught relationship with the Romans. Indeed, it, along with Scotland, were the only places in northwestern Europe that hadn't been invaded. 
the Roman term for Ireland goes a long way to explain why they never attempted to incorporate Ireland into their empire. Hibernia, the Roman name for Ireland, means land of eternal winter. However, with Roman provinces to the east in Britain and to the south in what was called Gaul, that's modern-day France, contact was inevitable and over time Ireland was slowly influenced by Roman culture. Indeed, the beginnings of literacy in Ireland originated in Rome. Owen, the earliest writing in Ireland, took the form of strokes drawn either side of a vertical line. This was based on the Latin alphabet of the late Roman Empire. However, their greatest impact was unquestionably the introduction of the religion of the late empire, Christianity. The popular story of the Irish conversion to Christianity is based around the 5th century missionary and patron saint of Ireland, St. Patrick. However, this isn't the full story. The conversion from paganism to Christianity was a slow, often dangerous process, taking several centuries, involving numerous missionaries, one of whom was St. Patrick. Indeed, we know Patrick was definitely not the first. It had been the Romans who had gotten the ball rolling. Through traders, returning merchants and captured slaves, it's almost inconceivable that Christianity would not have been introduced at some level long before Patrick himself arrived around 450. Indeed, as early as 431, Pope Celestine I sent a bishop called Palladius to what were called at the time the Irish believing in Christ. For this bishop, Palladius, who had spent the previous ten years in Rome before coming to Ireland, you can just imagine the fear he must have felt as he set out. He was going to what he would have considered the edge of the Western world, indeed beyond the frontiers, to out-and-out barbarian territory, which was, never in his mind at least, civilised by the Romans. For him, Ireland was the source of raiders and slavers attacking Roman Britain. Indeed, one contemporary described his mission as being to make the barbarian Ireland Christian. Next, we will look at what the so-called barbarian society this Palladius found looked like when he arrived. The society Palladius found when he arrived in Ireland was unimaginably different to life in the Roman Empire. Indeed, it looked nothing like the Ireland of today either. The island was divided into well over 100 kingdoms, or Thua, as they were called. Each of these kingdoms were ruled by what was called a Derbfina, or ruling family. The Derbfina was a family unit of a strange kind. Composed of all adult males who shared a common great-grandfather, it was they who were empowered to elect a king. They shared a form of collective responsibility to each other that made them accountable and punishable for each other's actions. In a society where honour was tremendously important and blood feuds were an acceptable response to certain slights, warfare was very frequent. In this society, modern notions of the individual simply didn't exist. People only existed as part of this wider family unit or derbfina. The idea of having this collective sense of identity, though, had an important function. This was a world where muscle and sword were dominant and it was useful having a restraint on some of the more boisterous men in society. If you think of it this way, people who went around causing trouble would have been constantly getting hassle from their family as every time something went wrong, it was the family who were held responsible. This unit, the Derbfina, was also the method through which a kingdom's lands and territories were distributed, a process which happened on an annual basis. However, most in society didn't have any stake or role in the distribution of land because when Palladius arrived in Ireland, he found what was a rigidly hierarchical and class-ridden society. At the bottom of society, there were large numbers of slaves. It appears that slave raids were carried out as far away as Britain and possibly even Gaul. Ireland's patron saint, St. Patrick, was originally brought to Ireland as a slave. Female slaves appear to have been terribly treated and regularly sexually abused. St. Patrick himself, in one of his surviving letters to the soldier of a slave trader called Caroticus, said, You hand over members of Christ as if it were to a brothel. Patrick was probably a good source for this, as he himself would have been a slave and would have witnessed much of this brutality. Life overall seems to have been pretty grim and difficult for women in this period. In fact, the dehumanisation of women in early Ireland was so endemic that the base unit of value was a cummel or slave woman, 
Above those in slavery, there were numerous other groups in society. One of the largest being peasants, who at best only enjoyed a slightly better status than slaves, being considered what was tied to the land and not allowed to leave the territory they were born in. Next we will take a look inside the houses Palladius found when he arrived in Ireland in 431. But before we continue on our journey, I want to take a quick break. When the missionary Palladius left Rome, bound for Ireland, the once great city was very much in decline. The Visigoths sacked the city in 410 and it was no longer the capital of the empire which had relocated to Ravenna. Its glory days were long gone. Nevertheless, no matter how much Rome was in decline, Ireland could not really offer much on the urban front in 431 when Palladius arrived. There were no towns or cities of any sort. The closest thing he might have encountered was a small hamlet of houses. The population, for the most part, were dispersed through the landscape. Just imagine how he must have missed the paved streets and running water of the Roman Empire. Housing was completely different as well. The medieval equivalent to the modern farmstead in Ireland was the Ring Fort. The remains of these scattered the Irish landscape today in their thousands and are one of the most common archaeological features in Ireland. Often called fairy forts, they were the most common abode in the early Middle Ages. They are usually constructed of one, two or three circular concentric earthen banks which surrounded a few structures including a house. The house would have been built with post and wattle walls plastered with mud and covered by a roof made from thatch. Internally they would have been smoky and dark, dominated by a central hearth around which the room was laid out. They had no chimney, but instead the smoke wafted through the door and seeped up through the thatch roof. This was an incredibly unhealthy environment, as you might imagine. Furthermore, there was no running water, heating, glass windows, showers, baths, lights, electricity, or any of the creature comforts we take for granted. These, for the most part, were only inventions of the 19th and 20th centuries. You can just imagine hours of sleep in these houses being punctuated by animals lowing outside, maybe dogs barking or people staying up late chatting. Our domestic life today is so very different in comparison, but this is down to the fact that we have double glazing, internal walls and relatively thick exterior walls which are insulated. As a structure, ring forts probably wouldn't have impacted on the landscape. In fact, in early medieval Ireland, virtually no buildings really stood out in the way modern multi-storey buildings do. They were all relatively low and mostly built from natural materials. Food-wise, people ate a variety of foods. Meat, fish, grain, nuts and berries were all eaten in abundance. The grain was mainly wheat, rye and barley, which was processed into bread, beer and a gruel of sorts. Eating grain, generally viewed as wholesome in today's society, had a detrimental impact on people's teeth in the Middle Ages. The grain was first ground into flour by millstones. However, this process saw tiny pieces of stone and grit find its way into food such as bread. When eaten, this led to chronic wearing away of people's teeth. In a study in the 1980s, the archaeologist Catherine Power looked at two mass graves, one from Viking Dublin and then another from the late medieval Tintern Abbey in County Wexford, and her findings were eye-watering to say the least. A huge percentage had chronic teeth problems from eating grit-laden bread. 25% of people had exposure of dentine or even in some cases tooth pulp. This would have meant that the nerves could be exposed and as anyone who has ever suffered something like this will know, the pain is beyond excruciating. This would also lead to abscesses and infections. In a world where there would be no antibiotics, relief was not easy to find. This doesn't even begin to mention how horrible people's breaths must have been. Without anything close to modern dental practices, there was probably only one solution to these problems to pull the tooth, which was a wholly frightening experience. Even as late as 1715, the English diarist Duddy Ryder wrote about having a tooth pulled and about how they pulled away part of his jawbone in the process. Dentistry in early medieval Ireland can't have been any better. Aside from lethal bread, general attitudes to food when your mouth wasn't hanging off were pretty different than today. 
in the Western world today, we only eat fresh, preserved or conserved food. In the Middle Ages, though, you have to imagine a time with no fridges, so preserving food in the first place was really difficult. People would have had a different notion of what fresh meant, and they would have eaten food that we consider as stale without a second thought. However, food-related problems were minor compared to some of the other issues people faced, particularly given that death was a constant companion, as we shall see next. While warfare contributed to what was a very high death rate in the Middle Ages, it was probably a smaller percentage than people imagine. Other factors were as, if not more important. For example, childbirth was a very dangerous time for women and infant mortality was also very high. Studies into life expectancy in Europe show a pretty startling low life expectancy in the early Middle Ages. Anglo-Saxon England had an average age of around 30, while from studies in France we know women might have expected to live until about 36 and men to about 39. Incredibly, I found a study of a region in Bavaria that revealed a mortality rate of 40% for people under 20. This meant in the medieval world, people obviously lived far shorter lives. The shadow of death and grieving was, if not a constant, always incredibly close at hand. The historian and one-time Monty Python actor Terry Jones has suggested that in a village of a 100 people, there could be a funeral up to every eight days in medieval Britain. This constant presence of death no doubt helped to shape what was an incredibly superstitious attitude to life. People believed in ghosts and spirits of all sorts. If a story of someone being carried off by a demon in the dead of night arrived from a neighbouring kingdom, you'd believe it. You'd probably have no reason not to. I think it's almost impossible for us in the 21st century to get our heads around much of this superstition and how it played a very real part in people's lives. There was no divide between the spiritual and material world. Indeed, this attitude, in many ways, is only gone very recently. As late as 1895, that's just 120 years ago or so, a woman called Bridget Cleary was burned by her husband in Ireland as he believed that she was possessed by an evil demon. Now, while burning someone alive is obviously a very rare occurrence, the superstition surrounding it was very real up until and into the 20th century, so we can only guess what it would have been like 1500 years ago. In this vein, I'm going to conclude this episode by returning to the story of Palladius and the business of making Ireland a Christian country. When the Christian missionary Palladius arrived in Ireland, Preaching to Ireland's early Christians, and more importantly, converting pagans, was by no means an easy task. For those he hoped to convert, the impact of becoming a Christian could be substantial. Obviously, on a basic level, pagans believe in many gods and Christians believe in just the one. But there were many other changes needed in day-to-day life if Christianity was to take hold. Fish had been eaten in Ireland since humans first arrived, but after the conversion to Christianity, the consumption of fish probably increased vastly. You see, early Christians banned meat for the 40 days of Lent, the 40 days of Advent, and the 40 days after Pentecost Sunday. This was only the beginning though. You couldn't eat meat on a holy day, and just in case you thought they were getting a bit lax, you couldn't even eat meat the day before a holy day either. This amounted to more than half the days in the year that meat was prohibited. Facing these challenges, it's difficult to know how many people would have converted during Palladius' time in Ireland. He was, though, quickly followed to Ireland by a more famous man who I've mentioned already, that's St. Patrick. He had been a former Romano-British slave, captured and brought to Ireland. Years after escaping, Patrick, in an act of divine inspiration, or some might say Stockholm Syndrome, returned to Ireland and practised as a missionary, where he seems to have met with some success. His stature, when compared to other missionaries, is probably due, though, to the fact that an autobiography of his life as a missionary has survived. While Patrick was probably more successful than Palladius, it is clear that the Christianisation of Ireland took several centuries, with Christianity struggling at times to replace paganism. Ultimately, the success lay in compromise. Instead of waiting for Gaelic society to change, the Christian church seems to have made the smart move. It changed. They co-opted pagan gods and made them into Christian saints, the most famous being St. Bridget. But they also adopted a new structure in Ireland, 
one more suited to the island and its unique structures that had developed outside the influence of the Roman Empire. In the early days, an attempt was made to structure the church along continental lines. This, however, was difficult as there were no cities in Ireland and there had never been a Roman structure onto which the early church had been grafted on the continent. In medieval Ireland, a kind of DIY Christianity seems to have emerged where monasteries became church centres in the absence of cities. The first monastery was founded on the Shannon at Clonmacnoise in 535 and quickly enough a network to include centres such as Glendalough, Durrow, Kells and farther afield at places like Iona which is situated off the coast of Scotland. Over time, slowly but surely, these monasteries consolidated the work of early missionaries and by the 7th century Christianity was unquestionably the dominant belief system in Ireland. However, it would not take long before the church and its unusual structure faced attack. Join me next time when the Vikings rampage across Ireland, attacking monasteries for a few decades, and then settle down and found a town called Dublin. Until then, Sloan. And don't forget to check out the website irishhistorypodcast.ie.